to you last week's title. My aim is to close that out and then to start the next title. We won't get through all of those today. You see there's a lot there. This will take us two weeks, Lord willing. So the title from last week is in the form of an interrogative. It's in the form of a question. The top of the, the um, left upper page, if you open your bulletin, page two, it says, which way will you be cut by this two-edged sword? Which way will you be cut by this two-edged sword? Everyone who comes under the hearing of the word receives a cutting of a sword. The question is, what type of cutting will you receive? What type of cutting? Will it be a cutting that is beneficial to your soul? Or will it be a cutting that is detrimental to your soul? Will the word of God quicken you and enliven you and speak to you and heal you and save you? Or will the word of God put you to sleep? Will it harden your heart? Will it cause you to rebel against the truth? My prayer is that it will be the former and not the latter. Amen. All right, if you will, I want you to go down to verse 12. <clears throat> and this, this was the last verse of our consideration last week. Really, verses 12 and 13. And we talked about verse 12 describing the word. Describing the word. Remember, the Apostle Paul is the writer of the book of Hebrews. He's writing to Jewish Christians that were converted from Judaism over into the gospel of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. This is 64 A.D., 63, 64 A.D. And we, we know historically what the backdrop is here, right? Those of you that have been tracking with us, we know that the major historic event that we're on the verge of is the destruction of Jerusalem, right? Right? Even your historical books will tell you this. The, the historical archives, if you were to go back in 69 and 70 AD, we know that Jerusalem was destroyed then by uh, the Roman uh, Titus and by the Roman government who came in, invaded, and destroyed Judaism. And the Spirit of God knows this, and the Apostle Paul is alluding to it as we work our way through the book of Hebrews. But he's He's writing to Christians that lived during that time, but he's also referring back to the ages when the Israelites were in the wilderness. They had experienced a physical deliverance from Egyptian bondage under their leader, whose name was what? Moses, who delivered them, right? And they were in the wilderness, and they circled for 40 years because of their unbelief. And Paul is saying, remember them. Remember the infamy of your foreparents. And learn from the mistakes that they made. And he says in verse 11, let us therefore, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Lest any man, what? Fall after the same, what? Example of what? Unbelief. So they were a model and an example of infamy because they were an example of unbelief. And therefore he says your your four parents perished in the wilderness because when they heard the word, they did not receive it in faith. Isn't that what he said? Go back to verse 1. He says it here. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as what? Unto them. See how he's making the comparison here? As well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. Your four parents in the Old Testament, how come? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Everybody see that there? So the word that your parents and grandparents in the wilderness heard, they heard it, but they didn't hear it in faith. It was a, 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 a word that actually condemned them rather than saving them. He said, don't do what they did. Now, go to verse 12. Now, we have a little bit of context. <clears throat> Paul is concerned because he said in, in verse 12, he says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a what? Discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So he's saying the word is able to discern your heart. It has penetrating efficacy and is able to determine, listen, whether there's faith residing in your heart or unbelief residing in your heart. Does that make sense? 
Because when you read through, you might wonder, what does verse 12 come in the context of all of this, right? All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Paul talks about the word being quick and powerful and all these things. What's that got to do with everything we just read? Now we know. Because he's saying the word, the promise, the gospel that was preached to the Old Testament saints was able to penetrate the hearts of their, your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and determine that in the heart of the large majority of those Jews, there was no faith. And God discerned that by his word, because his word is not a dead word. It's a living word. And listen, what it did then, it does now. What it did then, it does now. That means right now, when I'm preaching the word, the word is penetrating. The word is piercing it divides even down to the deepest part of your spiritual anatomy and is able to discern what's really there we can deceive one another but we can't deceive the true and the living god all of us have to come under god's spiritual mri machine did you get it we have to come under god's spiritual mri machine god's spiritual x-ray machine called the word of god and it's able to show what's really there and so he says that the word is quick. That means living. It's powerful. That means it's energetic. It's dynamic. It's active. It says it's sharper. That means it's incisive. It's cutting. It's penetrating. And he says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. He says two-edged. I want to talk about that now because it cuts two ways. Look at one C on your outline. Let's run through this briefly. One C. What's the significance of the word of God cutting two ways? While you're looking at that, can I get Ephesians chapter 6? I believe it's verse 17 on the overhead. I want you to see that we're clearly talking about the inscripturated word of God, but that's not all we're talking about. I want to develop it a little bit more. I hope you're interested. Watch when it says here, Ephesians 6, 17. It says, uh, take the helmet of salvation. This passage is talking about believers putting on the what? The whole armor of God, the whole spiritual panoply, panoply. Did you come in with your spiritual anatomy covered in the panoply? This is what we're all called to do. Take the helmet of salvation and the what? Sword of the spirit. We don't have to guess what that is. Look at the next line. Which is the word of God? Which is the word of God? Right. Scripture interprets scripture. Right. So with this, this sword, we know he's talking about. The word of God, and it has two edges on it. Go with me to the book of Acts. I want to show you a couple of examples in scripture in live action when the word is being preached and it cuts in a couple different ways. You know this by personal experience because when you got saved and other people in your family did not get saved, they turned on you. You know what I'm talking about because the word divides. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace on earth, but a sword. Isn't that what he said? Yeah, that's Matthew 10, 34 and 35. And so it would be peace if people believed the word. But the reason why people don't have peace is because they don't receive his word. Jesus is the prince of peace. If you want peace, come to Christ. He'll give you peace. If you reject Christ, you're rejecting peace. It makes sense to me. So look at Acts 2. Peter is preaching at Pentecost. And I want you to see the result of his preaching. Uh, it says, and um, I'm going to, for time's sake, I'm just going to start at verse 36. <clears throat> Peter is preaching at Pentecost, and he's preaching to the same Jews that killed Jesus. And he says in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who does the text say made Jesus Lord? God did, right? That means, you don't, that means you don't make him Lord, right? And, and I don't make him Lord. This is why when we present the gospel to people, we don't say, please, would you please make Jesus Lord? Too late. He's already Lord. He's already Lord. The Father exalted him to the right hand. You acknowledge his lordship. That's what it's talking about. In verse 37, here's the, here's the sword. Watch the sword. Now when they heard this, they were what? Pricked in their heart. Write it down. That term prick there means to be pierced all the way down. It's not just like a little prick, like a little needle. Boom. And you get a little cut. No, no, no. It means to penetrate and pierce all the way down. All the way down. Why? Because the spirit of God here is taking the gospel scalpel and cutting these men, taking out dead unbelieving hearts and giving a new believing heart. They're being regenerated. That's what's being described here. These men got saved that day. 
They got saved that day. Just like when you first heard the gospel, that's what happened to you. It penetrated your heart, pierced all the way down, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. God took out your stony heart and gave you a heart of flesh, didn't he? That's the fulfilling of the gospel promise in Ezekiel 36, 26, by the way. Right. So it's, it's a piercing all the way down. So you can write down, savingly slayed. Savingly slayed. Every person who becomes born again is savingly slayed. It's a slaying unto salvation. Isn't that good? Right. Now let me show you. The, that's one side of the sword. Remember, it cuts how many ways? Right. That's one side. Okay. It cuts unto salvation. God's got the only, only sword that can cut you and save you. Did you know that? He's the only one that can cut you and save you. He's the only one that can, that can fillet you and give you life. That's awesome, isn't it? Now go to chapter 5. Now here's the other side. Here's the other side of that. See, this is why we got to pray and we got to ask God to give us grace because when you witness to people, you're taking a sword to them. Did y'all know that? And if you mishandle that sword, you can hurt people very severely. Acts chapter 5. They're at it again, and I'm going to start at verse 32, and watch the apostles. They got a sword again. Verse 29, it says, And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Right? They had been in prison for preaching the gospel, and they threatened him um, and told him to stop preaching in Jesus' name. He says, We ought to obey God rather than men. Application to yourself. you got to do that to the, to today. Because more and more we have governmental authorities that will be encroaching, encroaching upon you, telling you to obey them, even if it means disobeying the word of God. The Christian does not have the right to set aside the word of God and put the word of the government over the Bible. The highest constitution in the land is the word of God, is the Bible. That's very important. Uh, you got uh, Daniel, Example, Daniel chapter 6. You got Sha uh, uh, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah in Daniel 3 as an example for us as well. And John the Baptist, I can go on and on. Okay, so it says we got to obey God rather than men. Look at verse 30. He says, the God of your fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. The tree is the cross. Verse 31, him has God exalted with his right hand or to exalted to be at his right hand. That's what that's referring to there. To be a prince and a savior for to give repentance. See it? To give repentance. That means repentance is a what? Gift. Repentance is not something you can do on your own apart from the grace of God. Repentance is your responsibility. God doesn't repent for you. You and I must repent, but we need his help to do it. We need his help to do it. Lord, help us to repent, right? The church needs to repent today. On so many different levels. Lord, give us grace. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Watch this. Verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. The Holy Ghost is a gift too, right? Who gave it to them? God did, not your pastor. That means you don't come up to the front to get the Holy Ghost. I can't give you the Holy Ghost. It's God in Christ that gives you the Holy Ghost. Through the preaching of the gospel. Now watch this. To them that obey him. Here's our verse. Ready? Verse 33. Here's the sword. And when they heard that, they were what? Cut to the heart. And they took counsel to love on them. Right? Is that? Yours doesn't say that? All right. It doesn't say that, does it? It says they were cut to the heart. And they took counsel to slay him, to kill him. Which way did the sword cut them this time? In a damning way. So the first group, Acts 2, they were savingly slain. This group was damningly slain. We know that because they hardened and rebelled against the gospel by hardening against the minister who was simply just the messenger of the gospel. And they hardened to the words of salvation. The word here, to cut to the heart, means, you can write it down to saw, in the Greek it means saw asunder. To saw asunder. It also means to cut all the way through. To cut all the way through. Do you see the differences in cutting? Differences in cutting. Let me show you one other uh, person that got cut or group. Go to chapter 7. We're in the damningly slayed category now. The first group, savingly slayed. The second group is being damningly slayed. Which way will the sword cut you? It's your responsibility to believe the gospel. It's your responsibility 
to hear the word in faith and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. If you're in Acts chapter 7, uh, uh, Stephen gives this whole 60-verse uh, dialogue here about the history of Israel. And, and notice how it ends up. <clears throat> he says in verse 51, verse 51, you stiff-necked <laughs> and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. You, you know it was on when he said that, huh? It was, it was on and cracking. Look at verse 32. It says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. Who is that? Jesus. It says, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Here's our verse, verse 54. And when they heard these things, they were filled with joy, right? No, they were cut to the heart, sawn asunder, cut the way through. They were damningly slain, but not because of God, but because of themselves. Not because of God, but because of themselves. God was merciful to give them the word. All they had to do is believe and they would, they would be saved. Is that awesome or what? You don't have to do any work to be saved. Jesus has already done the work. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Tell me where there's a better message than that. Tell me where there's a better message than that. There isn't. And so he says, here, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth like wild beasts. Do you see it? They were damningly cut. God's word, then therefore we can learn this is, and this is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, right around verse 15. The word of God, listen, is a savor of life unto life. But it's also a savor of death unto death. It's unto life in those that receive it and believe it. And it's unto death by those who refuse to receive it. Which side will you be on? That's the question. Which side will you be on? We see the sword going through our land. We see the sword coming uh, through our homes. And as I mentioned earlier, someone gets saved. If the Lord doesn't save all the family members at one time, the unsaved family members more times than not, one way or the other, in either a more explicit way or a more implicit way, one way or the other will begin to persecute the person that was converted. It happens every time. Haven't you experienced that? Right. So what do you got to do then as we make our way back to Hebrews? You got to be patient with them. Go back to Hebrews. You still got to love on them. Listen, Jesus said you got to even love your enemies, let alone your own household. Right. You got to be patient with them. You got to put up with them. You got to pray for them. We learned on Friday night that Jesus had to put up with family members that did not believe on him for over 33 years. Over 33 years. Read Luke 4. Read Mark 3. Uh, read Mark 6. We talked about that in our Friday night. You can go back and listen to the message. Jesus is our model and quintessential example. Isn't he, isn't he not? Isn't he? He definitely is. And so, Lord, help us to be patient because they might they might have uh, when you preach the gospel to them today, they might get hostile today. Their fangs might come out tomorrow. They might find themselves converted and loving Jesus like you. Don't you want to see that? Then don't give up on them. Don't give. Say somebody was willing to put up with your mess. Right. Right. You weren't always saved. Did you come out the womb saved? You're not John the Baptist. Right. No, you came out. You came out a viper in diapers just like me. Just like me, not wanting to have anything to do with Jesus. And then he came and saved you anyway. <laughs> saved you and brought you into the kingdom of Christ. Put your sins away. Made you the very righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. An heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. Indwelling you by his spirit. Right. Now be patient with other people. Love on them and preach the gospel. And wait on God to show up and change them. That's all. That's all. Let's go to letter D. All right, this is going to challenge us because we don't like confrontation today. We live in a very, very uh, hyper-sensitive, hyper-emotional culture, don't we? People are so easily offended. Child of God, you got to work on that. You got to work. We all got to work on it. I'm saying we. All of us do. We're too sensitive. We're too sensitive. We got to ask God to give us a thicker spiritual skin to be able to put up with people. We got to. 
And we live in an extremely postmodern relativistic era where everybody has their own truth. And we're oftentimes afraid to share the truth because we're afraid to step on people's toes. You better learn how to lovingly, gently start stepping on people's toes. Jesus will give them new toes. All right. Their feet will be shod with the preparation of the gospel, right? It will. Okay. Look at letter D. A powerful apologetic double mouth reality. The gospel has two mouths. That's part of what it means to be two-edged. If you're back in our text, look at verse 12 again. It says the word of God is quick. That's living. And it's powerful, energetic, we said. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's more incisive, more cutting. That's what that means there. And then it says two-edged. You can write it down. That word there means two mouths. The Greek word there means two mouths. Okay? And one of the ways I want to apply it is not only that it cuts both ways. We just looked at that. But it has two mouths in your head. If you, can, if you have a good imagination, the kids will be able to do this with no problem. Um, as we get older, we, we lose the ability to imagine things, I think, but uh, we can work on that. That's part of the reason why the benefit of hyper symbology in the word of God will help us in that area. I want you to picture a big old two mouth lion. Picture it in your head if you can. The kids already got it. They already got it. OK, that's the Bible. It's like a lion with two mouths able to doubly devour all that stand against it. We're told by one of our uh, anointed ancient sages that the word of God is like a lion in a cage. And too many times Christians are trying to stand in the way of the cage as if it needs to be defended. He says, no, 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 no. All you need to do is get out of the way and open the cage. The lion can defend itself. Doesn't that make sense? Right. So when we evangelize and we engage in polemics and we engage in apologetics, it's like opening the uh, lion's cage and letting the lion get out and do its own thing. Just let it out and it can devour all of its enemies and foes and break down every false stronghold. Can it do that? Right. But it ain't going to do that until you learn God's word. Because if you're not inculcating it, ingesting it into, into your system, in the time when you need it, nothing will come out. That's why we got to spend more time in the Word, less time on television. Less time watching the news. Less time on social media. More time in the Word, right? And then so you, you want to get better at just opening the cage. Some people don't know how to just open the cage. Open the cage and stand back. Practice doing, open the cage and standing back. That's part of the reason why we're doing our sword drill. Our sword drill helps you learn how to open the cage and get out of the way. Did you guys know that? That's what it is. Okay, <clears throat> so I want you to see this with a couple of Bible verses. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. I'm going to show you two verses. We're going to keep it moving. This is talking about apologetics. I was talking to a brother another day. doesn't go here, goes to another church. And um, God has blessed me to be able to co-labor. Uh, with this other person, I'll just say that. It won't say um, anything more. But they're a professing Christian, too. They attend another church. And we were talking about the blessing of being able to fellowship, you know, but, um, on the job. And uh, when we have downtime here and there and be able to talk about, you know, uh, Sunday's messages and what we're reading during the week and everything. I love when God blesses us to be able to fellowship with other believers. It's a real blessing. It's a real blessing. But I, I was talking to the individual and he was sharing with me. He, he doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know what to say. He, he, he loves the Lord and loves the word of God, wants to see people say, but doesn't know what to say. So I'm praying for him and encouraging him that the Lord would equip him so he would know what to say. Know this. It's God's desire for all of us to know what to say. It's not God's desire for you to be permanently, perpetually in a position where you don't ever know what to say. That should not be the case with you, especially if you're under sound expository, Christocentric Bible teaching and preaching in the Old and the New Testament. You should be accumulating the word of God in your soul. So when you go out, you do know what to say. By studying and by praying and spending time with the Lord, right? And, and, and treasuring up the word of God in your heart. We're going to talk about that. So two things. Uh, Titus 1.9. Just look at this verse here. T what is the book of Titus? A pastoral epistle. Pastoral epistle. And watch what the word here uh, says. As Paul is saying to Titus. He says, holding fast the faithful word. Is God's word faithful? 
See, it's not faithful if it has books missing from it, which it does not. It's not faithful if it's flawed or contradictory, which it's not. It's perfect, inerrant, flawless, impeccable, voracious, trustworthy, faithful. It's a historically reliable document. It has more manuscript copies than any book in human history. We can believe it and never doubt it. Never doubt it. All right. It says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he, by the word, watch this, and this is talking to you, child of God, that he may, that you may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, to be able to convict the gainsayers, the people that would want to uh, uh, seek to attack and challenge the word of God. The word of God is able to prepare you to defend it by opening up the cage so the gainsayers can be devoured up with the hope that they might be converted. But the word of God is able to equip you to do that. Here's the question. But do you believe that? A lot of Christians don't. Here's where a lot of Christians are in trouble today. Let's make this application to ourselves. I want you to write this down. This is where the church is in big trouble. I'm sorry I'm so passionate, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry either. Okay, I want you to write this two, two ways. Number one, Christians today have a very low view of the church. And Christians today have a very low view of Scripture. That's why the church is tore up today. We got to repent in those two areas. There's more areas, but those are two major areas. And you can see this when Christians are whole hum about coming to church and being with other people. You know there's a problem there. Low view of the body of Christ. The, the, the body of Christ was so valuable and so precious to Jesus that he laid down his life for her. And you can't spend a couple hours with her. See what I'm saying? That's a problem. And then a low view of the word of God. We spend very little time with it. Little time meditating on it. The words preach. People go to sleep. We don't, we don't spend time laboring in it, studying in it, retaining it. And then when we need to speak to people, there's nothing there. Because we have a low view of scripture. Lord, help us in those two areas. We will do a lot better. Okay. First Peter 3.15 is another one. First Peter 3.15, then we're going to keep it moving. All this is connected with the text. Because it's talking about the nature of the word. Yeah, that was a bad day when the Philistines took the ark, boy. That ain't our text, though. First uh, Peter three fifteen. Uh, notice what it says here. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What's that mean? Ready? Let him be your fear. That's what it means. Write it down. Let him be your fear. That's taken out of Isaiah, chapter eight. Isaiah chapter eight, right around verse thirteen or fourteen. They can look at that uh, in their own time. But that's what that comes for. Fear God. Let him be your fear. Not a slave fear, but a loving, reverential, respecting filial fear. Like he's your parent and you respect him. Right. And, and be ready to be ready always. See, to be ready? Be ready always. Help us, Lord. Be ready always to give and what? That is where we get the English word apologetics. Apologia is the Greek term there. Apologia. Apologetics, not I'm sorry, not apologize like that. <laughs> be able to defend the faith, to be able to give an answer when people ask you why you believe what you believe. And <clears throat> give an answer to every man that asks you. So the majority of the time we're waiting for doors to be open. We're not beating people over the head with the Bible. We're not running after people and hitting them over the head with the Bible. We're just going about our day, loving people, doing what we're supposed to do. And when the door opens, hey, man, they, wh why do you believe what you believe? Hey, there's something different about you. Hey, sis, there's something different about you. I'm glad you asked. It's my Savior. Right? And then God opens the door. Then you go through it. I said, be ready to give an answer of the reason of the hope that's in you with meekness, lowliness, gentleness, tenderness. Right? And fear. That's reverence and respect for God. And reverence and respect for his word, right? Okay, so, so the word is a powerful apologetic. I want you to see it like a two-edged sword or a two-mouth line that's able to devour the atheist argument, the agnostic's argument, the uh, false religionist's argument that would come against you. The word of God is sufficient to be able to um, overcome all of those things. So we got to learn to let the lion out of the cage. Remember when Jesus let the lion out the cage when the devil came to him with the temptations? Three times. You remember that in Matthew 4? Three times all Jesus said was what? Open the door. And then he said again, what? 
opened the door. And then he said one more time, what? He opened the door. The devil took off, right? Because he knew he wasn't the real lion. He only goes about as a roaring lion. But the real lion of Judah showed up and then the false lion took off running, right? Is that good? He'll do the same thing with you too if you take God's word seriously. If you don't take God's word seriously, this won't happen for you. It won't happen for you. You'll only experience it vicariously through other brothers and sisters in the church. But you'll wonder why you don't ever get victory in your, ex in your experience because you're not taking these things seriously. Ask God to give you the grace today to take these things seriously. Forget about yesterday. Say, Lord, help me today, right? But to do this, you got to fear and treasure God in your hearts and treasure up, not just treasure, but treasure up his word in your heart by hiding uh, thy word in my heart that I might not what? There you go. All right, let's go to our last letter from last week. Now, you got you to think with me on this one, okay? We've kind of touched on this before. So if you've been here for a while, um, it's not totally new. There might be a couple of aspects to it, but if you're brand new, you might not have heard this before. Uh, point one E on your, on your uh, outline. This is the last letter from last week, and then we're done with that one. Uh, the believers, trichotomous anatomy. The believers, trichotomous anatomy. That's not hard. Tri means what? Three, right? Right. So the trichotomy has to do with believers having three parts, or we can say tripartite. Tripartite. All true believers who've been regenerated are tripartite. You have three parts. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful example of the Trinity. It's a beautiful example and testament to the Trinity. God is three persons. We're three parts. That just makes sense, doesn't it? Father, Son, Spirit, body, soul, Spirit. It's one of the ways that we're made like God. It's really beautiful. Non-believers are not trichotomous. They're dichotomous. They have body and soul. But they have, they're spiritually dead because they, have, they don't have the life of God in them. And they're separate from God. That's what that means, okay? So, <clears throat> um, for time's sake, let's just put it uh, up on the overhead. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. While that verse is going up, please look at verse 12. <clears throat> look what verse 12 says one more time. While, while that verse is going on the overhead, it says, and I want to wrap this up here. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Soul and spirit. See it? Soul and spirit. That means soul and spirit is not the same. We're going to talk about the difference right now. Is that okay? Soul and spirit is not the same. What is a soul? And what is a spirit? We're going to talk about that. And obviously they have to have a body because he says joints and marrow, right? Doesn't that imply trichotomy? Body, soul. And spirit. Okay. And he said the word is able to go all the way down into your deepest innermost being. This is what he's saying here. Now Paul says this in another place. Look at this verse on the overhead too. And we're going to just spend a couple minutes talking about it. And then try to get through a couple letters before we close for today. It says here. Paul is praying for the church at Thessalonica. And it says the very God of peace sanctify you wholly or completely or entirely. And I pray God. Watch this. I pray God your whole what? And your, and your, so you guys just all saw it in the word of God. That's three parts. That's three parts. Okay. Soul and body be preserved, blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless God. He's able to preserve body, soul, and spirit until the day of Jesus Christ. Not one of his sheep can fall away because of the eternal security that there is in Jesus. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man ever pluck them out of my hand. Right. So let's talk about the soul. And uh, uh, I don't need to explain the body to you. Right. You see your body. So what is the soul? So you want to write this down. The soul is that animating part of you, the animating entity within. Your soul is that animating entity within. Your soul is invisible. Your soul is immaterial. Your soul is incorporeal. Your soul would contain things like your personality. Your personality is a part of your soul. It's who you are. When we get to heaven, we will 
we will look different. There'll be some things that will be the same and some things that will be different. But one of the things that won't change when you get to heaven is your personality. It'll just be a sanctified you. It'll just be a sanctified personality with all the flaws washed off. Did y'all know that? A regenerated personality. Okay? But you will still be you. <clears throat> you will still be you. So your soul is invisible. It's immaterial. It's incorporeal. Your, your, your soul is that animated entity that departs from you when you die. When the soul departs from a body, they're what? They ain't hard. When the soul departs from a body, they become what? Dead. That's not hard. Right. It, your body's just a shell. Okay? Your soul is your personality. Your soul is the center of your desires and your passion and your, your will and your cravings and your affections and your thoughts. They're all housed in the will. Let's take it a step further. Your soul also primarily operates horizontally. Horizontally. It's primarily focused and fixated on the things of this world if it's not regenerated. Okay? Here's another thing I want you to know about your soul. Your soul is primarily self-conscious. I want you to write that down because you're going to see the opposite in a minute when we get to the spirit. Primarily self-conscious. That has to do, your conscience and conscious is different. Okay? Conscious has to do with your awareness, but conscience is uh, knowing self. The word conscience, C-O-N-S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, conscience, really means self-awareness. Con means with. Science is, is knowledge. To know yourself. To know with is what that word means, okay? <clears throat> and it, it primarily operates on a horizontal plane until it's been regenerated. When you're regenerated, the Spirit of God enters in you, Right? And then he quickens you by the power of the resurrection of Christ. And then he creates in you a new what? Spirit. Can I get Luke uh, 146 on the overhead? He creates in you a new spirit. So check it out. You, if you're a believer, your body, soul, and spirit, and the Holy Spirit is in you. You have your own individual spirit. Yes, you do. Read Ezekiel 36 and Romans chapter 8. It would describe it. And the text we just saw. And the text we just saw. And here, watch. You guys, I think we saw this before. Mary said, my what? My soul. Y'all interested still? This is, this is important teaching. My, my, Mary said, my soul. My soul just magnify the Lord. Look at the next verse. And my what? Spirit. She's not saying the same thing. She's not saying the same thing. She's trichotomous. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. See, even Mary needed a Savior. We're getting ready to go there. We're getting ready to go there. And she, she needed a Savior, too, because she was a sinner saved by grace just like us. She was not sinless. Only Jesus is sinless. Okay? What, what is your spirit? You can write it down. Your spirit also is invisible. Your spirit is also incorporeal. Can't feel it. Can't put it on a scale. Right? You can't, you can't weigh it, but it's there. It's immaterial. Incorporeal and it's immaterial. But it's present and alive in all believers. It's present and alive in all believers. Ready? I said a minute ago that your soul is primarily what conscious? Self-conscious. Your spirit is God conscious. You see the connection now? Look, one goes horizontally. See me? One goes horizontally. Y'all getting this? One goes horizontally. The other operates vertically. Do you see the cross? That's good. I just thought of that right now. See it? See it? See it? That's good, isn't it? Is the Lord good? That's right. It's only through the cross work of Christ that you get to experience that. That's really good. Without the cross, you ain't experiencing that. It's, it's, it's vertical in that it connects with God and has a relationship with God. And then, then we can worship God in spirit and in truth. You can't worship God in spirit without the Holy Spirit. And you can't worship God in spirit if you don't have a living spirit. Does that make sense? And it operates vertically. This is what makes humans and animals differently. Animals are dichotomous. But true believers are trichotomous. Animals have body and soul. Read Ecclesiastes 3 in your own time. Don't have time to go there. You can read it in your own time. Animals have a soul. Right? You know them little animals, them little critters you got running around the house? They, it, and they got little personalities too, don't they? They do. Right? They're not persons. That's not what I'm saying. Get, I do want you to get what I mean. But they're all different. They're all different, Right? And they have their ways about them. They're, they're cute, um, but they're not humans. They're not humans. 
They have souls, but believers have spirit. That's part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Animals are not made in the image of God. You and I are not evolved animals. We're made in the image of God, made from the dust of the ground. God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. We're human beings made in the image of God. God didn't do that for the animals. And now we can go back to our text. This is how you and I are able to have a relationship with the true and the living God because of the cross work of Jesus Christ. Regenerating us by his Holy Spirit who comes and applies the atonement that Christ rendered for us at the cross. That's good news, isn't it? All right. Now look at our second title. <clears throat> look at our second title, please. It's on your outline, too, about halfway down. Y'all see that there? <clears throat> it says, the supersession of the Aaronic priesthood by one far greater. Everybody see that there? This will be our closing thought for today. The supersession to supersede means to replace and to supersede something implies not only a replacing of it, but it implies a superiority to it. Did you guys get that? That's what it means to supersede, to supersede. So the supersession of the Aaronic priesthood by one far greater. That means that there's a priesthood that's better than Aaron's priesthood. That's what we're going to talk about. OK, I right, look at verse 14. This might be as far as we get to day. Watch this. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest, not just a high priest, a great high priest. But what's the book of Hebrews about? Jesus is better. Right. So it makes sense why he would use that term, because he's making a contrast. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. That's his resurrection, isn't it? That's his ascension, isn't it? To the highest of heavens. He tells us who he is. Jesus, the son of God. Let us do what? Hold fast our profession. I already know where he's going. I already know where he's going. When he said that, let us hold fast our profession, I want you to write it down. What is he doing? He's, he's encouraging the people of God to not go apostate. One of the major themes of the book of Hebrews is to continue in the things of Christ. Because the Jewish Christians were leaving the gospel in droves to go back to Judaism. Like people today are leaving the church in droves to go to false religion. Today, neo-Catholicism. We're going to talk about that in a second. So go ahead. You can write that down. Neo-Catholicism. This is what we are battling today. Like that group that came here a couple months ago, wanted to fight and wanted to argue. And we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them spiritually. And we said, okay, we're, we're willing to set up a meeting with you. And they didn't want to come back because they didn't want to talk about Christ. They didn't want to talk about Christ. We ain't seen him. They ain't been back since. All right. But here we're focused on Christ. We want to know Christ and exalt Christ. All right. <clears throat> See where it says hold fast? Let me tell you what he's saying there. <clears throat> hold fast. Ready? It means be strong. That's what it means. Uh, it comes from the Greek word kratos. It's kratomen. Kratos means to be strong or powerful. Strong or powerful. And it implies that Paul was concerned that there was no strength in these uh, newly converted Jewish Christians to abide in the gospel. I'm seeing the same thing today with weak, undiscerning Christians that are so easily deceived and turned away from Christ at a moment's notice. It burns. How undiscerning so many professing Christians are today that they're so easily hoodwinked, hoodwinked and bewitched by something else that's not the gospel. And they're leaving the churches in groves for demonic doctrines of devils. First Timothy chapter four, verse one and two. If you need a Bible verse, so you know, I'm not making these these things up. So he's saying, hold fast your profession. Continue. If you depart from Christ, you will never make it to heaven. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, right? All right. So let's work through these letters. Uh, uh, point number one, it says the tremendous blessings of our great high priest. Is it okay if we exalt our great high priest today? The tremendous blessings of our high priest. Jesus has been resurrected. Jesus has been exalted. Jesus has ascended to the highest of heavens. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. And Jesus right now, right now is interceding for you. He's interceding for you. This is why a, a, a white, hot lightning bolt of the wrath of God has not zapped your tail. 
Because Jesus is interceding for you right now. Father, don't zap her. See my wounds. See my wounds. And it's sufficient. It's sufficient. First thing I want you to see here is letter A. The omniscient priest who sees it all and covers it all. He sees it all. Does Jesus see it all? And does he cover it all? Not some of your sins. All of your sins. Okay? Okay. What I'm talking about verse 13 look at verse 13 neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight verse 12 was describing the word of God being quick and powerful right the inscription rated word but then verse 13 describes that same word as a living incarnated word a personal word his name is Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ the word in the beginning was the and the word was and the word was God. That's Jesus, right? Check this out. This is awesome. Verse 13 is describing Jesus as the living word. And then in verse 14, Paul is still continuing the thought, seeing then that we have a great high priest. Listen, the great high priest in verse 14 is the living word in verse 13. Y'all see it? It's the same person. It's the same word. The word ascended to the right hand of God where he's interceding for us. See it? So why am I saying that? Because verse 12 tells us that that word is penetrating and is a discerner of the thoughts and the tense of the heart. Verse 13 says, there's nothing hidden from him. All things are open and naked unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, right? So he sees it all. Verse 14 implies that he covers it all. Is it? Right, he sees it all. I'm so thankful. He, he, he sees all my sins and he also blotted out all my sins. Nathaniel. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Y'all remember that? You know what that means for you and I? You and I are Nathaniel. And Jesus, uh, who has all knowledge and has prescience and knows the end from the beginning, saw us way back in the fig tree of eternity past, even before we were born and came into this world and saw everything we would do, every sin, every iniquity, every transgression, and he still came anyway. He still came anyway and still died for our sins, rose again for our justification, and is now interceding for us as bad as we are, as bad as we are. So let me help somebody. Let me help somebody. Because when you're a new Christian and you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, what happens is you're, is you're entering into more deep and profound revelations of the glory of Jesus, and you, you rejoice in that, right? But guess what else you learn? You also begin to grow in a deeper, more pro profound understanding of your sin and depravity. <laughs> and, and some days you get depressed. Some days you have bad days like, whoa, I didn't know I was that bad. But what you think is that Jesus is like you and he didn't know how bad you were. And Jesus already knew and he still died for you. Jesus already knew and he still died for you. We can make a t-shirt with that one, right? <laughs> He already knew, and he still died for you. It's taking you by surprise. It's not taking Christ by surprise. All right? Just tell him, confess it, keep on moving. That's all you got to do. Tell him, confess it, and keep on moving. Keep on moving. It doesn't take him by surprise. So the, the living word from verse 13, who sees all things and sees our hearts and knows all of our transgressions, also atoned for all of those transgressions and paid them in full, rose again to the highest of heavens, Proving his sacrifice was accepted. And now he's at the right hand of God interceding for his people. You can lay down your head on your pillow at night and know you're secure if you're believing on Jesus Christ. Listen to me. You can, you can, you can because the father raised him. If Jesus was not really the son of God, the father wouldn't have raised him. If Jesus really secretly had sin. If Jesus really was playing footsies with Mary Magdalene, like a bunch of people try to lie and accuse Jesus of, the father would not have raised him from the dead. If he really wasn't the spotless lamb of God, the father would not have raised him from the dead. That's clear, irrefutable, corroborated proof that Jesus Christ is everything the Bible says he is. It's everything the Bible says he is. Does that make sense? Right. Letter B. <clears throat> The new covenant 
does not leave us high priestless. This one's going to hurt a little bit, just letting you know. Okay, um, look at verse 14. The new covenant does not leave us high priestless. I'm going to tell you why I worded it that way. Verse 14, again, we might only get through another letter or so before we wrap it up. But look at verse 14 again. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, I'm going to tell you why he said that. That is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Continue your profession. Continue believing in him. Continue trusting him. Continue following him. Okay. Uh, 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 one of the reasons why Paul uses this as a means of encouraging the Jewish Christians to hold fast their profession is think about it. What was the, under uh, Judaism? What was the highest position in the Old Testament? What was the highest position in the church in the Old Testament? Anybody know? Write it down. High priest. The high priest. In the Old Testament, the high priest was the big dog, okay? As some of the, the Christian Jews might be tempted coming out of uh, <clears throat> Judaism to think, okay, we, we're, we're leaving Moses and Aaron, and we're leaving the Old Covenant, and we're, we're, we're coming over to Judaism now. Under the Old Covenant, we had a high priest. But now we just got a Bible teaching pastor and elders and deacons, right? Well, we don't have a high priest. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. This is why Paul is saying that there's no need to apostatize to think that somehow you might be lacking in the Christian gospel as if you don't have a high priest. In fact, you do have a high priest in Christianity, but you have one that's far greater. You have one that's far greater. And this is why he says that we have a great, a great high priest. OK, <clears throat> so not only is this a an encouragement to converted Jews not to apostatize from the gospel to go back to Judaism. It's an encouragement for us. And we're going to make an application to ourselves. Y'all remember Brother Job in the Old Testament? Can I get up Job 930? Did you guys know Job struggled with the idea of not having a high priest too? Did y'all know that as you go back? Now, now, the first book in your Bible is Genesis, obviously, but chronologically, the book of Job was before uh, Genesis. The time of Job is even, uh, even before, obviously, before the times of Moses and implies at least the time period of Abraham, maybe even uh, further back. And so there was no sacerdotal priesthood in existence at that time. But Job would have known by a personal uh, a revelation from God and by an experience of, uh, of God revealing truth to him, he would have understood something of a need of a priest and a mediator. Now, God tore Job up not to destroy him, but to sanctify him and make him an object lesson for us in many ways. Now, watch what it says in Job 930. Uh, Job says, if I wash myself with snow water, cleanest water you can use, and make my hands uh, uh, never so clean. Look at the next verse. He's speaking metaphorically here. Yet <clears throat> shall you plunge me into the ditch and my own clothes shall abhor me. What he's saying is that if he tried to justify himself as if he was somehow intrinsically pure and sinless, God would be able to point out so many sins it wouldn't even be funny. And he would actually be defiled if he were to see what God was able to see because God would be able to more than thoroughly convince him of his transgressions. Clear evidence that Job never uh, failed to acknowledge his sin. There are some people that would say, well, Job was sinless. The, the, the book of Job doesn't say that. Job clearly in multiple instances in the book of Job confessed his own sin. There's only one person that was sinless and it's Christ. All right. Look at the next verse. He says, for he is not a man as I am. God is not a man that I am as I am that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. He is like, hey, no competition. He would overwhelm me with his wisdom and his power and his intellect and his articulation and elocution. I'd be I'd be I'd be laid out prostrate. <laughs> Ain't no way I could contend with him. Right now, the next verse is what I want you to see. Neither is there any days man between us. No days man betwixt us. What is a day's man? A day's man is an arbiter. A day's man is an umpire. 
A days man is a mediator that's able to stand in between two uh, hostile parties and be able to reconcile the situation, be able to put his hand on one party and his hand on the other party. Neither is there any days man between us that might lay his hand upon both. The laying the hand in the scripture symbolizes several things, not only conference, but it, it also implies authority and power. Authority and power. So this man, whoever he is, would have to be able to bridge the gap to be able to stand between uh, a Job, who's a man, and God. Put his hand on Job, put his hand on God. That means he has to be both God and man. Who is that talking about? That's Jesus Christ. The day's man here is Jesus. It's Jesus. Now what this is teaching us is Job felt like he didn't have a mediator, but he did. You ever been there? There are times in your life where you don't feel like you have a high priest, but you do. Don't make your feelings Lord. Don't let your feelings uh, 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 testify to you in a way that contradicts the word of God. Feelings come and feelings go. Uh, 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 feelings are fallible. Feelings will deceive you, but the word of God cannot. This is the battle we all have. And so many times we let our emotions and our feelings lead us and guide us and direct us even when it contradicts the word of God. Our feelings are wrong so many times. But the word of God is always right. You have a friend in Jesus. You have a friend at the right hand of God. Even on your worst day, he promises to intercede for you, never leave you, nor forsake you. And listen, the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for you. No matter how you feel, you have a friend on the throne. So cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. Isn't that what the word says? That's right. So, so Job felt his need of a mediator and a high priest. And he has one. And the Jews that Paul was talking to were inclined to feel like if they left Judaism, they wouldn't have a high priest. They felt like they would be high priestless. But they're not high priestless. Neither are you and I. You and I have a high priest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take this a step further. Turn with me to a couple of passages, please. Psalms. Uh, let's go to 110. Psalms 110, we've got a little bit more time, try to make the most of it. Psalms 110, and there are so many passages, I want you to know we're just scratching the surface on this, from Hebrews 5, 6, and 7 at least, we're going to be talking about the priesthood of Christ, so we're just warming up, we're just warming up, okay, Psalms 110, when Christ was on earth, he operated in his role as an atoner, atoner. Now he's in heaven, having occupied the role of an intercessor. Did you guys get that? Okay. It's important. Psalms 110. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for time's sake, I'm just going to read verse 3 and 4. This is a messianic prophecy about Christ. Look what it says in verse 3. This is the father talking to the son. He says, your people, that's, that's us who are believers, shall be willing in the day of your power. See that? They will be willing in the day of your power. That means that implies that before his day of power comes, we're not willing. Right? That means God is able to save people who are not willing. Your unwillingness is, is no obstacle for God. Right? You're, you, you think your unwillingness is omnipotent? God can deal with your uh, uh, he he can deal with your unwillingness and change it. That's why you're here. One day you would ha you wouldn't have been caught dead in church on Sunday under the preaching of the gospel. Here you are. Is that right? Is God good? He changed your unwillingness, and, and so be encouraged for your unsaved loved ones and friends and neighbors and family members who are hostile against Jesus Christ. Don't think their unwillingness is too big of a barrier for God. We deify unwillingness today. Don't we? And we exalt man's imaginary free will above God and think God cannot save a person because their unwillingness is too powerful. They first have to unlock the door of their unwillingness and be free to let Jesus in. That ain't nowhere in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Bible. Acts chapter 16 verse 14 says that God opened Lydia's heart. It doesn't say Lydia opened her heart and gave Jesus permission to enter in. It doesn't say that. 
The Lord opened her heart. So the Lord's able to change somebody's will. And the only way you're going to be saved is if God changes your will. And if you're willing, it's because he made you willing in the day of his power. Isn't that right? Are we, are we okay with giving God the glory for that? Yeah. So now, look, verse 3, your people shall be willing when? In the day of your power. That's gospel saving power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning that has to do with the regenerate being born again, cleansed in the blood of Christ, made holy and covered in his holiness and righteousness. And you have the dew of your youth. True believers who've been re regenerated like number are like the dew. Anybody able to count the dew? Of course not, right? And the people in heaven will be more than the stars in, in, in the sky and the sand of the sea and the dust of the earth and the dew for number. But the dew here also is a symbol of newness and purity as well and regeneration, newness of life. Verse four is what I need you to see. The Lord has sworn. He's sworn and he will not repent. God does not change his mind, does not change his will, does not change his purposes. Okay. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You, this is the father talking to the son. You are a what? Priest for a little while, right? Forever. Forever. If Jesus is a priest forever, we bet not call another man a priest. If Jesus is a priest forever, we bet not call another man a priest. That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. And it's wrong. It's unbiblical. Jesus is a priest for or, uh, forever after the order of Melchizedek. I can't wait to talk about that. When we get into Hebrews 5 and 6 and 7, we will be talking about the Melchizedekian priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be really, really good. And we're praying that the Lord will bless that. But Jesus has an eternal priesthood. And you want to write this down by oath. That's one thing I'll throw at you now. This is Hebrews 7. I'm just going to throw it out there. We'll develop it when we get there. Hebrews chapter 7. It tells us that Jesus Christ, his high priesthood is by oath, which sets him apart from all the other priests in the Old Testament. God swore to Jesus that he would be our priest even in eternity past. This conversation here is a protological conversation. How about that? All right, we'll use this one until we get this fixed. Okay. Okay, this is what I want you guys to see here. Uh, one more. One more. Turn with me to Zechariah 6. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 6. I want you to see one more thing here. <clears throat> We're considering the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The priesthood of Jesus Christ. Now, the priesthood of Jesus Christ... I'll give you a little hint here. Part of what it means for Jesus to have a Melchizedekian priesthood is for Jesus in his priesthood to be a king and a priest. Remember, Melchizedek shows up in Genesis chapter 14. He was a priest and he was also the king of Salem. Right. Salem is peace. Christ is the king of peace and prince of peace. And he's our high priest. So Jesus is a king and a priest. Like Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Melchizedek did not come from the Levitical line. He's not, not a descendant of Levi. I know I said I wasn't going to get into it. I won't say anything else. He didn't come from the Levitical priesthood. Melchizedek just kind of showed up out of nowhere, didn't he? A beautiful picture of the son of God who just showed up out of heaven. Who didn't come from the Melchizedekian priesthood. And Abraham, just one more thing. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek because in Abraham was the Aaronic priesthood. They were in Abraham's loins. So when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, he was acknowledging the superiority of the Melchizedekian priesthood. Right? The inferior pays homage to the greater. Right. And so it implies that Jesus in his Melchizedekian priesthood has a superior priesthood to the Levitical and Aaronic priesthood that must pay homage to his priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood only covered sins ceremonially. Jesus in his Melchizedekian priesthood put the sins away for real. I better stop there. Because when we get to Hebrews 5, 6, and 7, then you won't show up because we're already dealing with it. So let me stop right there. So Jesus is our high priest. One other passage that we'll probably have to wrap it up. If you're in Zechariah chapter 6, look at verse 9. Verse 9, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me. That means Jesus came to him. The Father is speaking to his prophet through his son. 
He says, look at this in verse 10. Hey, hey, Zechariah, I want you to take, uh, uh, take of them of the captivity, uh, even <clears throat> Heldai of Tobijah and Jediah, which are come from Babylon. See, this is the exile from Babylon when they came out. They went into Babylon 70 years and then they came out. They're back in the land. And he says, um, and come thou the same day and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Now, what does he want him to do? Verse 11, I want you to take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the who? So I want you to write down here, Joshua points to Jesus. He's going to wear a silver crown and a gold crown. Why? Silver is a picture of redemption. Jesus, when he died at the cross, died because he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Silver symbolizes redemption. But then he had a silver crown. And he also had what kind of crown? The gold signifies Jesus being a king. He died as our high priest. He was resurrected and exalted to the right hand of God as a king. Jesus is both king priest. You get it? Right, so both of these crowns point to the one to come, Jesus Christ. And he says, take the silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. He's a, he's a picture of Jesus. Verse 12, and speak unto him, saying, watch how Jesus shows up. <clears throat> Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, behold, the what? The man. The man that's coming. You can write it down. That's the incarnation. That's the coming virgin birth of the Savior who would become a man and be born into the world, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem us from the curse of the law. Galatians 4, 4, Galatians 4, 4. That's what it says. And then it says here, behold, the man whose name is what? The branch. What did we learn in theology? The term branch means? Woo, y'all. Oh, <laughs> ain't been that long. All right, Messiah. The branch is another name for Messiah. It's another name for Messiah. It's in, also in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. In Isaiah 11, 1. All right, we might have to go back over that again. The branch. The branch is the Messiah. It's talking about Christ. The branch, and he shall grow up out of his place. He would be born in Bethlehem, grew up in the hood, in Nazareth, right? And he should build the temple of the Lord. What did Jesus say? I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Isn't that what he said? Are we not the temple of the living God? There you go. You are because Jesus made you so. Because the Father placed you in Christ. That's why. And Christ redeemed you by his blood. Made you a new creature in him. And he should, it says he should grow out of his place. And he shall build the temple of the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 13. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. That's the church. He's talking about you if you're a believer. He's talking about you if you're a believer. And he shall bear the glory. Who does all the glory belong to? Jesus. And he shall sit and rule upon his throne. Is that our resurrected high priest? Yeah. And, and it says, and he shall be a what? Upon his what? The, it, it, right. So priest, that's his priesthood. Throne implies what? Kingship kingship he's our king priest and the council of peace should be between them both them both well there was only one man mentioned here Zechariah why does he say them both do y'all want to know because it's referring to his two offices as our risen high priest and our risen king who is on the throne and yet symbolically also at the right hand of God interceding for us. He's both our king and priest, king of kings and Lord of lords. And our text just told us he's our high priest who's entered into the heavens. Jesus Christ, the son of God, right? Y'all getting it? Right. This is talking about Jesus Christ. Okay. <clears throat> Implications. Let's make an application for ourselves today. That means if Jesus... Christ, Jesus Christ, go back to our text. If Jesus Christ is our high priest, as Hebrews 4.15, maybe we can get that up as we go back and start wrapping this up for today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. If Jesus Christ is our high priest, look. Uh, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. I need a uh, verse 14. <clears throat> Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Not high priests, plural. A great high priest. 
right? So that means you and I have to be careful not to make other people high priests that are not high priests. That means your high priest is not your president. That means your high priest is not your governor. Your high priest is not your mayor. What's the longest that any of those three uh, persons can occupy office? Eight years. Why? Because eight is the number of new beginnings. There always has to be another to replace them. Jesus Christ rose again technically on day eight. Day eight, yeah. He was in the grave for three days. But the first day of the week for those, for the, uh, the Jews, their day started the first day of the week was Sunday, like us. Right. Well, they didn't have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. We do our, on our calendar, but it lines up. Watch. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Technically, Jesus rose again on the eighth day in a sense. Because the number eight is a number for new beginnings. This is why Noah's family was in the ark and it was eight people because God was starting over. Eight is new beginning. So every eight years at best, if they make it that long, they have to be replaced. And I'm so thankful because all, they're so flawed. Right. But Jesus Christ is the ultimate new beginning that never gets replaced. Never gets replaced. No one can replace our high priest in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Right. Right. So that means we don't give high priest status to any earthly ruler. That means your pastor is not your high priest. That means you don't have to come to me to get to Jesus. You come to Jesus right where you are by faith from your seat, by your heart, by believing on Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? That means your high priest is not. Mary, today we're fighting. I want you to write down neo-Catholicism. It's a big fight in the Christian church today. People, here's the connection. I'm going to stop here. We won't do any more letters. I'm gonna, this is my last point. Um, in Paul's day, uh, Jewish Christians were tempted to leave Judaism, uh, uh, Christianity, to go back to Judaism. Today, people are tempted to leave the Christian church to go to Catholicism or a form of of neo-Catholicism, some other uh, uh, form of religion that is based on legalism, self-righteousness, and works religion. Okay? Um, I've been watching podcasts lately, and men who are supposed to be, uh, 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 supposed to hold Christian podcasts, and, and having uh, men on that are, are advocates of having more than one mediator. Uh, coming out of Catholicism and, and Orthodox religions and uh, asserting that you and I need additional mediators and go-betweens to get to God. And trying to justify by mutilating the scriptures. Trying to justify praying to Mary. Trying to justify praying to dead saints. That's a big one. What's the problem with praying to dead saints? Well, they were godly and, and they knew the Lord and they had the spirit of God. And you're able to ask other living Christians to pray for you. Why can't you ask dead saints who died before to pray for you? That's a terrible argument. That's a terrible argument. Praying, number one, if I'm asking another believer to pray for me, I'm not praying to them. I'm talking to them, but I'm not praying to them, number one. The other problem with that is it's witchcraft because it was forbidden in Deuteronomy chapter 18. We got to know our Bibles. It's called, write it down, necromancing. Necromancing. Oprah Winfrey used to have people come on her show. This one lady, I can see her face, but I can't remember her name. Evil looking lady. <laughs> Evil, scary looking lady. And she claimed to be able to communicate with the dead. And she would have people in the audience tell me your, 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 your great aunt's name and your great, great grandmother. And I will conjure them up and I will communicate to them. And, and, and she did so-called communication with them and would say, they told me to tell you this, that, and the other thing. She was communicating with devils and they're communicating with devils today when they do that. And we don't pray not only to dead saints, we don't pray to angels. Angels are not mediators. First Timothy two verse five makes it clear. We have one mediator between God and men, the man Christ 
Jesus. Nobody else is getting you to the Father but Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Is that what the Word of God says? That's what the Word of God says. And so we don't, we don't enter into a confessional booth either. You don't need a confessional booth. Who is that dude? Who is that dude in there calling himself a priest? He's lying on God. He's not a priest. He's a fallen sinner just like you. He needs the real high priest just like you and I do. Jesus Christ is the high priest. The confessional booth is in heaven. And we look to the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and confess to him. And he can actually do something about our sins. In fact, he's already done something about our sins. Put them away by his death at the cross. Washed them away in his blood. Blotted them out as far as the east is from the west. And justified us. He justified us. Uh, this is going to hurt too. Your high priest is not your brother and sister in Christ. Okay? So, so you, what you don't do is so exalt and venerate other brothers and sisters in Christ as if they're the only ones that can pray to God and get their ear as if you can. Don't get me wrong. There are times when we're really jacked up. We need another brother, sister, pray for us. I got that. I got that. But if you're a believer, you have a relationship with God, too. You can go to the throne, too. You can pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he can hear you, too. He's got blood that can wash your sins away, too. You need to go to him. You need to go to him. Does that make sense? Right. That, he's the one that we need to depend on. Don't put your other brother or sister in that place and just dump all your problems on your brother or sister like they Jesus. They can't bear all your sins. They got their own they got to deal with, right? Um, are you guys in Hebrews chapter 4? Look at, look at 1C. Let me throw this out there. I just feel like we need to hear this and we'll pick it up here next week. Letter C. You can put a line on it. See, when you put a line on it, it means we can't go no further. Put a line on it. This gospel high priest, Jesus Christ, is better than Aaron. I'm going to give you real quick. He's better than Aaron. See what it says here? He can be touched. Uh, I, I love this. He can be touched for those of us that are touched. Some of us are a little touched, huh? He can be touched for those that are touched. All of us are, to some degree, touched. Just a little touch. I know I am. Uh, I'm so thankful God saves messed up individuals. Bless God. Look at, look at verse 15. We'll close here. For we have not, we do not have a high priest, which cannot, I love those, the double negative there emphasizes the mercies that we have in Christ. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. See that word touch there? That's King James. It means to sympathize with. The word touched there means to sympathize with. It literally means fellow feeling. It's two Greek words, soon and pathos. It literally means to feel with. Christ is able to feel with us. He's able to sympathize with us and know what we're going through. And then it says he was tempted. See the word here? It says we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of uh, of our infirmities, but was in all points what? <laughs> all right, I want you to write this down. The term tempted there, two things, because we got to go eat birthday cake. Uh, uh, number one, it means to be tempted externally. Um, that's not the lexical meaning. I'm going to tell you that one in a minute. In reference to Jesus, it's referring to Jesus being tempted externally you and i are tempted externally and internally jesus could only be tempted externally the reason why jesus can you put up john 14 30 this will back this up jesus could not be tempted internally because he did not have a sin nature he did not have a sin nature there was no way for the temptation to penetrate into a sin nature or a sinful heart that could actually take hold to that temptation and transgress because he was pure completely through and through. Listen to why he says this. 1430. 1430. While he's putting that up, the text says he was tempted and he was in all points tempted, right? He was in all points tempted. That means he was in all points tested and tried in every way. That's what it means. What you are going to hear is people say, well, listen, Jesus, 
is not able to really understand and relate with other sinners because he didn't have any sin. You ever heard anybody say that? Can, can I help you guys with that? That's not true. That's bad. But he doesn't understand because, yeah, he was tempted, but he never committed any sin. So he's not able to relate. Let me give you two reasons why that's not why that's not true. Number one, all of the sins of all of God's people were placed on Christ. He way more knows about the 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 guilt of sins because he took all of the sins of his people imputed unto him. Listen, and the guilt that comes along with it, feeling the guilt as if he was the one that did it. Don't tell me he don't know. He doesn't understand. Multiplied times all the billions of people he died for. He's able to more than understand. In his temptations. It's experiencing the full brunt and the full experience even further than the rest of us. Because you and I fell in the, te in the temptation way too quickly, didn't we? We fell way early on. So we didn't experience the whole process. Did you get it? We didn't experience the whole process because we failed. But he experienced the entire process. Even when we fell short, he kept going. He kept enduring. He continued to experience the entire process and overcame it sinlessly. Therefore, he's more than qualified to sympathize with us and to understand us and comfort us. So you can go to him with your pain. You can go to him with your struggles. You can go to him with your affliction. He knows what you're going through and is able to more than meet your need. Way more than any other human being. He's precious, isn't he? He's precious. Write these down real quick. This should take us 60 seconds. I'm going to tell you how Christ's priesthood is better than Aaron. I'm going to touch on it here. I'm going to throw seven things at you real quick. We'll pick it up here next week. How is Christ's priesthood better than Aaron's priesthood? Okay. This gospel high priest, which is point one C, is better than Aaron. Here's seven ways. Number one, Christ is in, he in, in heaven. Aaron only went into the tabernacle, right? Is that better? Christ went into heaven. Aaron only went into the tabernacle. Number two, Christ is God's son. Aaron's just another man's son. Christ has touched with your infirmities, right? He knows what you're going through. Aaron's not aware of what you're dealing with. <laughs> Did you get that? Is that true? All right. Christ was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Aaron is a sinner who made a golden calf and worshiped it. Christ was tempted externally. Aaron was tempted internally. Christ had no sin. Aaron was full of sin. Christ's priesthood is permanent. Hebrews 7.24. Aaron's priesthood was only temporary. Christ's priesthood actually put sin away. Effectually. Aaron's priesthood only puts them away ceremonially. Only typically. Does that make sense? Aaron's priesthood never saved anybody. Aaron's priesthood never washed away sins. Christ's priesthood saved an innumerable amount of people from an innumerable amount of sins. And he can do the same thing for you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. Amen.